people think you had a pretty good debate, but the big elephant in the room, or rather the elephant wasn't in the room, <laughs> was that Boris Johnson didn't bother to turn up. He's running not to be just leader of the party, but prime minister. So he's got to be prepared to talk to the public, communicate, listen and be challenged on the big question, which is how is he going to deliver Brexit? The problem in this whole debate is there are all these men, and they're all men, standing up saying, trust me, I'm going to deliver it by the 31st of October, and not a single one is laying out how they're going to do it. How would you do it? I would stick with the withdrawal agreement. I'm not pretending I'd go back to Europe and How negotiate any deals. did the d withdrawal d agreement get defeated in the House of Commons? Three times. Right. And what would you change about it to make it pass? I wouldn't change anything. I think the attempt to keep changing it is the problem. What you have to change is the votes in the House of Commons. And that's tough to do. It's not easy to do. But, but Theresa May, with respect, Rory, yeah. Theresa May <clears throat> got an absolute drubbing. Some of her losses on this vote were the worst in parliamentary history. Mm. And most people think that you're a very smart, eloquent, articulate guy, right? But they also fear <clears throat> that you're a Remainer who basically doesn't want you want <clears throat> one break. Sorry. <clears throat> You were Brexit shouting rather too much. I was, yeah, lost night, my voice really. last night. But who doesn't really believe in Brexit at all, mm. rather like Theresa May, which is why she got herself into the mess in the first place, is that her heart just isn't in it. And when people listen to you, they go, well, look, he's a smart guy and he says all the right things. But fundamentally, if your position is, I'm going to keep trying to do what Theresa May failed to do, how can that be a winning proposition? Well, t two things, Piers. Firstly, my heart is definitely in it. I've been advocating very, very strongly for Brexit from the moment the vote happened, because although I voted Remain, I promised, as pretty much every other MP promised, to respect the result of that referendum. OK, can I just Whichever you, way it went, yeah. OK, which, which is yeah. wonderful for those people who voted for Brexit, because you're absolutely right, that respects democracy. But what does that say about your principles? What did you say about leaving the EU before the referendum result came out? Well, I said two things. I said, firstly, that... I believe in respecting the result of the referendum. That's a very important principle for me. Yeah, but what and did you I... say about leaving the EU? Did you think it was a good idea or a bad idea? I said it was a bad mm. idea. Right. The reason I thought it was a bad idea is particularly about security in Eastern Europe and about the environment. And I made those arguments strongly. But when I made those arguments, I also said that this isn't a decision just for me. Yeah. This is about our national identity, this is about our national future, okay. and it's for the public but just to choose what future okay. they want. But just because 17.4 million people vote for something, mm -hmm. how does that possibly change issues around the environment and issues about security? It doesn't, but it would be like my standing in an election, let's say I stood as a Conservative, passionately arguing for what I believed in, mm -hmm. and the Labour Party won. I would respect that but result you didn't and I would suddenly, allow them Sorry, to with respect, mm -hmm. you didn't then if, if the Labour Party wins an election, you don't suddenly say, I now believe in everything that the Labour Party stands for and I've thrown away all my Tory principles. No, I wouldn't say that, but I would say our democracy requires that vote to be respected. So in this case, Brexit is happening. Brexit must happen. It's what people voted for. And I think it would be deeply divisive okay. to have a second referendum. But my, we'll point, but my yeah. point about principle is surely you stand by what you believe in and you stand by your principles in politics. And just because somebody else wins doesn't mean you suddenly throw away all your principles and all your beliefs about something being right and wrong and go, OK, well, they won over there, so I'm going to go and join them. There's a more important principle, which is the principle of democracy, which is that in the end, I'm elected and the people run this country. So when the people make a choice, mm. my job is to deliver that choice energetically, optimistically and okay. as professionally as I can. But can you not understand that there are people, and possibly a number of Brexiteers, who think, actually, this person just doesn't believe in the project. I can completely understand, but what they need to do is watch, uh, watch what I've done for the last two and a half years. Look yesterday, at my yesterday, I tweeted, after watching on Andrew Marr, that I thought you were smart, eloquent, articulate and so on. Gary Lineker responded, basically agreeing with me, and you then responded, saying it's an almost unprecedented scenes where Lineker and Morgan come together. Um, in a way, having Gary Lineker supporting you is probably not a good thing for a Tory candidate. You know, he's a very ardent Remainer. He clearly sees in you somebody that shares his values. Many would think that actually that, that does not lend itself to you being a Tory leader. Well, I definitely don't agree with Gary on remaining. I believe in Brexit, but I do believe in bringing people together. And the point about that tweet is that the country is deeply, deeply divided. It's a country that, however many times you held a referendum, is split almost straight down the middle on this issue. We need to deliver a Brexit that 
works well for our economy, that's a great success and that can bring people back together again. And I think Your... the problem with a no-deal Brexit, which is what everybody else seems to be leaving on the table and talking about, is that it's not going to achieve what Brexit voters want. Well, except, want except in one sense... In what, right, but in one sense, what people say is that your idea of just prolonging the Theresa May attempt to get this plan through is doomed to absolute failure because it doomed her to failure and lost her her job. And what they say about no deal is that at the very least no deal would bring some kind of end to this, that the public are basically sick and tired of it, want to get on with it. And frankly, if the government, having had over three years now to prepare for no deal, is not prepared for it, has to prepare the country for it, then shame on them. Why are we not prepared for a no deal? And why in negotiating... Would we ever take off the table one of our Trump cards? I don't get it. Well, firstly, if you watched the debate last night, four out of those candidates kept saying, no deal would be terrible, it would be very damaging to our economy, I'd never want it, but I'm going to leave it on the table to negotiate. Mm -hmm. How do you know it would be terrible? No, no, but let, let me just finish on that. you believe it would be terrible? Let, let me just finish on that one. Yeah. How do you negotiate a deal saying, if you don't give me what I want, I'm going to do something to myself that I've just said is suicidal and terrible? I mean, this is not a negotiating ploy at all. The second problem is, you can't get no deals through Parliament. We live in a parliamentary democracy. So the only way that Dom Raab has of guaranteeing delivering no deal is to suspend Parliament. And suspending Parliament is disgusting. What did it's you think about Britain entering the euro, for example? I thought it was a very bad idea. You thought it was a bad very, idea? Very, very bad idea. Right. But most idea. of the people screaming loudest about uh, a no deal being a disaster were the same people who screamed the loudest that actually we should enter the euro or it would be a disaster. So I'm quite cynical mm. about all these bold statements of certainty about no deal when the very people telling us it will be a yeah. fiasco, you accepted, <clears throat> said the complete opposite last P time. Piers, I'm with you. Bold statements of certainty are a bad idea. Ditto bold statements of certainty that no deal is going to be great. I mean, there was a lot of machismo last night of people saying, I'm going to get a different deal out of Brussels. And whenever I said, how are you going to do it? They just said... Trust me, I'm a great entrepreneur. You're asking us to trust you that you can get a better deal than Theresa May on the existing withdrawal plan. When the EU has made it absolutely crystal clear, they're not going to budge, not least on this issue of the Irish backstop. So, so Piers, I'm, I'm actually the one person not saying that. That on this, Steve Baker and Nigel Farage agree with me. I don't think Europe is giving any different deal. In the end, the problem isn't in Europe, the problem is in Parliament. It's about getting 45 more votes. How will you change and, their minds, and, then? Well, so two things should help. There's nothing guaranteed in this. If it was guaranteed, we would have left the European Union months ago. But two things have changed. One of them is the European elections will have given a real shock to members of Parliament. Mm. The public feel very, very angry. They voted to leave. Mm. They were supposed to leave in the end of March. Mm. I voted again and again to leave, and it was blocked. And it was blocked because people are trying to make the perfect the enemy of the good. Because people have been pushing for their ideal version of Brexit, mm. they've refused to vote for any real version of Brexit on the table. You are one, of the, all right, you are one of the few people uh, running whose, whose momentum appears to be growing, apart from Boris. The others, you know, no one's really firing. It has brought attention to your voting record, which many people say is classic Tory. You voted Tory on pretty much I, everything I'm down the party line. Yeah, I'm a Tory. Yeah, so, no, I'm not saying yeah, you should be yeah. you know, ashamed of that. You can embrace it. But this has also <laughs> included the fact that you've been, you know, generally voting for reducing, uh, reducing housing benefit for social tenants, deemed to have excess bedrooms, the uh, so-called bedroom tax, always voting against paying higher benefits over longer periods for those unable to work due to illness or disability, etc., etc. You know the argument, which is that actually underneath this nice, Bonamy and cheery chappy that Gary Nineke loves so much is a bloke with pretty hardline Tory voting record. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm a conservative. I believe in being sensible with money. I believe in trying to make sure that we get people into work. I'm very proud that we've got 700,000 disabled people in work who weren't previously. I think that we've now sorted out the public finances and we can invest more if we're lucky and we manage this well in education and infrastructure. But I'm proud to be a Conservative. Are you actually, ashamed that under the Conservative government we've had a massive spike in people having to go to food banks in this country? And if you are ashamed of it, why have you not been screaming about it before? I've been travelling around the country, and like you, and I guess like everyone watching this, I think there are a lot of things that are wrong. Is but it shameful that there are food banks in this country being used by people under an economy which is supposedly the sixth biggest in the, in the world? Well, I think there are two things. I think, firstly, we went through a very difficult financial crisis. We've had to get the finances in order. 
I think if we can deliver a good Brexit, we will have 26, 27 billion pounds potentially to invest. And we need to invest in prioritising this. Would you pledge to stop anyone in this country having to use a food bank? I mean, do you share the public outrage that this is happening in our country? I share the public outrage, but I also believe the public deserves, particularly a Conservative Prime Minister, to be straight about finances, not make promises we can't deliver, not promise to spend money we don't have. So yes, my priorities would be to focus on education, on food banks, on infrastructure, mm -hmm. and on making sure that we really sort out adult social care. Why, but have I'm not, I'm out, why have you ruled out serving in a Boris Johnson cabinet if he wins? Because I profoundly disagree with his principles. I see which no princi plan. Which principles? I see no plan here for delivering Brexit. All I see is an assertion where he says, I'll take you out by the 31st of October. And if he doesn't have a plan, then I'm worried he's so going to let you down. So you're 100% saying that if he wins, which seems very likely as things stand, you 100% will not accept a cabinet position? Yes, 100% I will not serve in his cabinet. many people will say, hang on, you, you just been banging on about being a Tory, a loyal Tory and all the rest of it. Just because the other guy wins, and wins, by, looks like, by a thumping majority, the way things are going, that you, despite all the momentum you've had for yourself and raising your profile and so on, would then refuse to serve your country simply because you don't like him. Mm. This is going to the heart of the questions you were asking me about principles. And it's a difficult question in politics. But in order to be Boris's Foreign Secretary or International Development Secretary, I would have to sit on your programme and advocate for a no-deal Brexit that I think can't be delivered, it's mm. going to lead to delay. Hang on, you're sitting, you're sitting here, you're sitting, you're sitting here because... advocating. There's a contradiction here. Well, Susanna said can to I, you... Can a... I point yeah. out, sorry, can I just point mm -hmm. out, the day before the referendum, you said that leaving the EU was a bad mm -hmm. idea. The day after the referendum, you suddenly changed your mind because the majority voted to leave the EU. Couldn't the same principle be applied that if the electorate of the Conservative Party decide that Boris Johnson is the right man to be leader and Prime Minister, then you would suddenly think it was a good idea to serve in his cabinet? The referendum is a much bigger thing than that. That's 17.6... Bigger than who's going to be Prime Minister? 17.6 million people voted in that. And before that referendum, when I was asked the question, I promised to respect that referendum. And I'm telling you now, before Boris becomes Prime Minister, that I would not serve in that cabinet. Wouldn't That's you respect saying... the vote of the Tory party about who should lead your party, a party of which you are a loyal member and MP? Wouldn't you respect that vote? There are two votes that I really deeply respect. I respect the result of a referendum. I respect the result of a general election. I'm a loyal Conservative, so I'm not going to bring down a Boris Johnson government. But I cannot serve in a cabinet and advocate for something I don't believe in. Should we and know? Should we know? Whoever, whoever wins this contest, mm. are we entitled as the British public to know basic facts about the person that becomes prime minister? Absolutely. And tell me, ask me. I mean, what I well, for, well I'm not going to ask. For instance, if Boris was to win, mm -hmm. do we know how many children he has? Uh, that that I don't know. But I, you don't know? I, I've no, no idea how many Doesn't it strike you as pretty extraordinary? Is it relevant, you may... do you think? I, I don't... Personally, I mean, it's a diff, people have different views on this, think that you need to look into the souls of politicians. I think the question is, what is his plan? How's he going to live a Brexit? How's he going to sort out... It doesn't matter to you that we don't know how many kids he may have. No, I think what matters is, is he the guy that you want to trust running the country? The big question is, what sort of Prime Minister do you want? Do you want somebody who is prepared to appear in a debate? prepared to engage with the media, prepared to listen to you, prepared to... Private life completely irrelevant? Well, look, the, the, in the end, it's a democracy. It's a choice for you as the voter. But I would argue that our country's changing, that politics is a little bit broken, mm. that we need to move on. OK, final question, because uh, we've got to move on. We're expecting people to fall out now in the next 24 hours, 36 hours. Are you in for the duration? Are you going to come under pressure to, to get out of this race or are you going to fight to the finish? I'm going to... Absolutely, Piers, and fight to the finish, because there are many people in this race who seem to be running to be cabinet ministers. I'm already a cabinet minister. Mm. If I want to be a cabinet minister, I wouldn't be in this race. Okay. I'm running to try to make this country a better place and a happier place. Okay, that's Piers' fi final question. My final question is, you said that you respect the result of the referendum and that you respect the result of a general election. If Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party win the general election, will you skip parties and become a Labour MP? No, but I would respect the result and I would be the loyal opposition to Her Majesty's government, which would then be run by Jeremy Corbyn. It would be a terrible thing for the country, but I would respect it because I live in a democracy.